I'm going to start recording. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm Linda from the Upper Saddle River Library and very welcome to Cheryl Passwater from Contraband Ferments. I'm very excited to hear about not only Misu, but she's also going to talk again with some other things, uh, show us how to possibly make some things and all the health benefits and flavor bombs we can get out of this. So I will pass it over to you. Cool. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, like Lisa said, I'm, my name is Cheryl Passwater. Um, I run Contraband Ferments in Brooklyn, New York. I'm a um, master fermentationist, preservationist, and functional medicine student. Um, so microbes are sort of my um, jam, along with mold and a lot of other fun things. Um, and so um, tonight, we're going to cover quite a lot. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of fermentation and what that is. A little bit about the history of miso. So we just have some backstory as to why are we why are we taking this time and waiting to make this thing. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about ingredients and substitutions. We're going to talk a bit about um, this stuff right here. It's called koji. Ironically, also the name of my cat. Um, and you know, we're going to talk about best practices for making miso. Um, I am going to do a demo. Um, but I'm going to talk you guys through a lot of different ways to do this, where you can sub out some of your ingredients, add in some extra things, um, so that you don't feel totally stuck um, when it comes to miso making. You know, my goal is always, if you could come to a workshop with me and you could rip off the recipe of in and and throw it away and feel like you could do something, I've done my job. And so we're going to cover um, a few things. I would definitely, you know, feel free to take notes. Um, if you feel like you want to or have something to, you know, sort of scrabble, you know, scribble down little pearls of information, sometimes that um, can be nice. Um, but we will talk about safety. How do I know I'm not going to kill myself and my loved ones? Um, and we'll talk about also just secondary uses for miso, whether you're buying it in a store or making it yourself. Um, and, you know, anything else that sort of comes up. And yes, the chat is open. Um, so Lisa will throw some things as I um, bring them up in the chat. But also um, feel free to throw questions um, in the chat. And as I'm sort of able to, I will try to get to them. And yeah, we're going to dive in. We have a lot to cover tonight. Um, so that being said, you know, what is miso? Miso is um, a fermentation process traditionally made with soybeans. Um, and yes, you can use other kinds of beans um, that is mixed with what's called koji, which means moldy rice. Koji is spelled K-O-J-I, and it means molding rice in Japanese, all right? So um, that is sort of our jumping off point. Uh, but fermentation in itself is about the, the breakdown. It's using microbes, molds, yeasts, um, and other things, bacteria, to break down or digest some kind of substrate. So, you know, if I was making sauerkraut or if I was making miso or if I was making kombucha, there's some kind of digestive process. And really fermentation works because as long as there is fiber, sugars, and carbohydrates, you can ferment things. Um, and so fermentation is over 10,000 years old by written documentation. Um, that is a really long time, um, and actually that earliest written, written documentation talks about kimchi, and it actually talks about, in this poem, about kimchi originating in China, which I think is sort of an interesting, fun fact, and that they would take um, cabbage, put it in salted beef bone broth, put it in vessels, and bury it in the ground, and leave it to ferment. Um, later on, as we learned with all kinds of fermentation, um, it was migrated by Buddhist monks and Portuguese traders and landed in Korea with red chili flakes and ginger and garlic and things that we all probably more traditionally associate with something like kimchi um, sort of came um, to kind of half pass and happen. But what we also know is there's over 100 kinds and varieties of kimchi and miso is no different. Um, there's a million different variations of miso there. And there are, you know, what we all probably know is more like Japanese misos, if you guys are familiar with miso. But there's also Korean misos and Chinese misos. Um, there's a whole trading war between countries around miso. Um, it's this really amazingly long, lengthy process. And um, what we know about fermentation, again, is that it's always migrated and moved. It's both a preservation technique 
Um, it's a way to get through the seasons, preserve food, but it's also um, has a lot of nutritive value. Um, and whether you know, the earlier ancestors and makers of fermented foods knew that there were these nutritive kind of microbial advantages, um, or even to call it fermentation, um, we do see that there's this sort of interestingly long history of um, different cultures using fermented foods medicinally, and um, again, getting through the seasons. And not to mention umami, that fifth flavor, right? That sort of flavor bomb. Um, you know, one of my favorite things in the world to make, and I'll tell you guys how to do it at the end, is miso caramel popcorn. And like, you know, talk about like, you know, I don't know, it is like the best thing in your mouth that is, I call it crack corn um, because it's so, so tasty. Um, and so we see this kind of long, long history. Um, people have always known to use these processes, um, you know, before there was like the Department of Agriculture and all these other kind of restrictions and things. And, um, and that's something really, really what that tells us is not only has it been around a really long time that our ancestors knew how to use these foods. And so I always like to tell people fermentation is powerful medicine, but it is not a cure-all. Um, you know, I don't want anybody to walk away and be like, miso's going to cure all my disease or something like that. That's not the case. But what we do know is the fermentation process, um, a lot of things actually happen. Miso is actually um, super high in amino acids, um, almost to the point where its amino acid profile is not to the same point as eating meat, but very high. Um, a lot of B6 vitamins and B12 vitamins. Um, and stress is such a big depleter of our B6 vitamins. So um, yay miso, right? Uh, but also that miso um, is known to actually help move metals out of the body. So if you've ever been through any kind of like radiation and chemotherapy, um, you've had some kind of metals poisoning, maybe that's from cavities or maybe, um, you know, my first sort of background in life, I'm an artist and, um, you know, was working in printmaking and metals all the time. And so, you know, I eat a lot of miso to kind of make sure I'm not, you know, helping move metals out of the body. Um, you know, it's also known as an energizer um, food, um, meaning that it's sort of been known to help with vitality, giving us energy, long life, um, et cetera. There's a million other reasons to eat miso, but these are just a few of sort of the high lighted um, reasons to do it. And so, um, and, you know, and the other thing that I will say is with miso is what's really fantastic is it lasts a really long time in the fridge, <laughs> like a really long time. You can ferment it for a really long time. It's what's considered kind of a slow ferment. And, um, you know, again, it's tasty as can be. And so good stuff. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the ranges of miso. How many of you guys have gone to a store, let's say Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or wherever, a Japanese market, and you're standing in front of like the, the thing, the fridge full of misos, and you're like, I don't know what any of this means. All right? I mean, definitely, definitely, okay, good, a, good, a good portion of us. So let's talk about that. Um, because this really determines a lot about how we make miso. So, um, Miso ferments kind of like wine. If you think about wine, how it ages, miso is sort of similar in its concept. Um, but how it really works is um, the lighter colors and the darker colors. So you might see like yellow miso, white miso, sweet white miso, right? Brown miso, red miso, right? And then these kind of variations. But a lot of times on the label, it will tell you how long it was fermented. So the rule of thumb is this, the lighter the miso, the lighter in color, the less it's been fermented. And part of that is because it has more koji. So more koji and less beans. So lighter misos will always have more koji, less beans. They've been fermented for less time. Um, so sometimes you might see that a label says like zero to three months, or it might say six months to a year something like that, right? And as it keeps going, and when we start to get to those darker misos, you will always see that they have gone for a longer amount of time, usually a year, sometimes longer. Um, I actually just grabbed this one. Um, this one I did not make it, take, can't take credit, but this is a three-year fermented miso from South River Miso that's dandelions and leeks. 
and it's been in my fridge for three years <laughs> on top of it being three years fermented. So this is like six years old of a miso. Um, but they go longer and those longer, darker misos means they have more beans, less koji. So there's this sort of beautiful range that happens. And ultimately, I always tell my students, you are ultimately the deciders. You're the deciders of the fate of your miso. Um, I will give you guys some principles and guidelines and things, but really you guys, you know, I won't be with you <laughs> when you pop these babies open in three months or six months or a year from now. And so it's, it's nice to know that you hold the power and you guys are really, you're the deciders of your miso's fate, if you, <laughs> if you will. And so it's something to sort of think about. And as that miso really ages, those lighter misos tend to be a little bit more sweet because koji is a little bit sweet in nature. Now you guys all have koji sitting in front of you. If you took a little piece of koji and put it in your mouth and kind of chewed it up, you can taste a little bit of the hint of sweetness in it. So feel free to do that if you would like to. Um, you know, give it a little suck on it, chew on it. Um, it's not gonna hurt you or anything like that. Um, and those darker misos are going to be a little bit more sour, strong, salty, a little bit more earthy. All right. And so those, that's the reason that the flavors change. So the next time you go to a market, a Japanese market, and you're considering buying some miso, like go grab a couple things, you know, even if your miso is not ready because um, you can get different flavor profiles with them. And, you know, I like to use my lighter misos, especially in the summer months or in the spring. I like to put it in dips and salad dressings, on fish, all kinds of things. And those darker, earthier misos, um, I, you know, like to use as soup and I like to use them in ramen and I like to make miso caramel popcorn and, you know, different things like that. And so, um, they are not all equal, I guess, is the point um, to that. Any questions so far? There was a question in the chat saying that somebody had bought their own koji, but the koji we were given was browner. But the, the koji, I bought the brown rice miso yeah. koji, no. right? I think that's the, the answer. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. So we're going to talk about ingredients here. So um, koji is, again, it's rice that has been inoculated with what a mold spore called Aspergillus oryze. Um, and Aspergillus oryze um, is just, you know, again, a mold spore. And how koji in itself is made is traditionally with rice. Now that might be white rice. It might be brown rice. So to answer your question, Teresa, you probably have a white rice koji, and the rest of us probably have a brown, the brown rice koji. Um, you know, while koji is traditionally, again, grown on rice, it's also traditionally grown on barley. Um, a little, little not as easy to find. Um, and barley koji is a little bit more earthy, but you can grow koji spores, aspergillus, on all kinds of substrates. So I've grown it on buckwheat grits and used that to make um, miso. I've grown the spores on um, butternut squash. I've grown it on sweet potatoes. Like the koji in itself, the spores um, are amazing. You can make charcuterie. You can cure meat. Um, so for those of you, if you know, if you decide, oh, to snag some koji in the future, um, if we have time, I'll talk about more about other things you guys can do with it because koji in itself, well, yes, you can't have miso without having koji. Um, you can make amazake, which is like a kind of like a fermented the Japanese milkshake. Um, you know, you can do so many cool things with it. And so, um, you know, this is something that, you know, is a tool in my toolkit that I have in my fridge always, whether I'm making it myself or I'm purchasing it. Um, you know, I know Lisa ordered from one of my favorite companies called South River Miso. Um, so if you're looking to buy more koji in the future, um, they're a great place to order from. They are not open in the summers. So don't try to order koji in the middle of summer because you'll be waiting until the fall. Um, but also they make amazing miso. So if you're like looking to get into it or having a little miso party with friends, like give it a go and it's super fun. Um, you know, another great company that you can order koji from is um, called Rhapsody Foods. Um, they're up in Vermont, really great. Um, cultures for health, other places. So, um, you know, again, traditionally done with rice, but you can find koji grown in a lot of different ways um, as you get more into your experimentation. 
Right, so there was another question in the chat about cooking of the, the soaked beans. Um, I think I wound up cooking mine, the black beans, for about 20 minutes on a low simmer, and I feel like that's good. I don't know if that's right, but I have a lot of beans left over, so if it's wrong, I can redo. <laughs> No, I mean, until they're al dente, you don't want them to be too soggy. I'm going to come back to this in a minute, Jen. So hopefully, you're, if you're, unless you're in like a crisis, like trying to decide if your beans are done, let me know. Um, but otherwise, um, I will come back to it. <laughs> um, all right, so Koji. Koji is our friend. We can't have miso without Koji. Um, so this is, the, you know, really the key thing, again, to miso making. Let's talk about beans for a second. Um, traditionally, miso is made with soybeans. Um, I don't make a lot of soy-based miso. The main reason is um, soy allergies are a thing, but also um, I don't like genetically modified foods, <laughs> like at all. So I really recommend if you're going to do soybeans, get non-GMO soybeans. Um, now, a great, great company, and Lisa, if you can throw this in the chat, will be good. It's called Laura, like the name, L-A-U-R-A, soybeans. Um, they're a company in the U.S., they grow amazing non-soy, um, I mean, I'm sorry, soybeans that are non-GMO. And so Laura si soybeans, I love them. And their price is actually very fair for non-GMO soybeans. Um, but the cool thing about miso is that we can use other beans. So Lisa's using black beans. I don't know what kind of beans everybody else picked out. Feel free to throw it in the chat if you want to. I'm actually um, living in Virginia for a little bit and so I'm actually using tonight, these are actually heirloom, heirloom Virginia cream peas. Um, and so I got these from a local farmer. I'm really excited to make some miso with them. Um, but you know, other beans that you can use, chickpeas, amazing miso. And zuki beans make amazing miso. Um, I've actually been super surprised by mung beans and some of the misos that I've had. Um, I, I really try to pick beans that are really flavorful on their on their own. Cranberry beans, I feel like, are a favorite um, over here. Orca beans. So, um, you know, the, I would, again, I like to pick things that beans that I know, if I was going to eat a bowl full of them with a little bit of seasoning, they would just be outstanding, you know? And so that's kind of how I go about picking beans. Um, and, you know, and I'm a big fan of heirloom beans um, and stuff like that. So, to each is their own of what you uh, try, you know, try to choose and use. Um, now, beans that I think don't work as well, pinto beans are a little weird. Um, I haven't liked many of like the lentil, lentil misos that I've made, um, you know, so again, pick something that you think is going to be interesting and have some good flavor. Um, you know, try not to pick the blandest bean on, on the earth and you'll be okay. So, all right. Koji beans. You have those two things, you can make miso. It's really that simple. So um, let's start with this. Let's talk about salt. All right. Now there is a key thing. Um, you guys are going to want to use, I forgot my salt. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So salt. Let's talk about this. This is really important because we are trying to grow mold and microbes, right? We would all agree. That's part of fermentation. You're going to want to use a non-iodized salt. Sea salt, a Himalayan salt, a Celtic salt. You might have non-iodized kosher uh, diamond crystal salt. Um, but the big thing is having a non-iodized salt. Why? If I get a wound, and I am, it's getting flooded with bacteria. I don't want to get infection. You would put iodine on it, right? It would kill the infection. But we want to grow microbes. So if we're putting iodized salt, we're making it harder for the fermentation process to happen. We're making the ferments work harder. So, you know, any kind of standard ground salt is awesome, as long as it's not iodized. I love the company Redmond's Real Salt. Um, I think it's worth a little extra bit of money. Um, they mine it in the United States. It's full of minerals. Um, I buy it by the gallon bucket here, as you can see. Um, and a bucket like this usually lasts me a, a pretty significant amount of time. Um, and so Redmond's Real Salt is awesome. But don't, the two notes I will make are, you're not going to want to use um, like a finishing salt, like a Malden salt or a coarse salt. And the reason for that 
is those thicker grains of salt, they melt over time. And what's gonna happen is your miso is gonna turn out too salty in the end. All right, so because miso is a longer ferment, we're actually gonna use a pretty good amount of salt in the fermentation process. Um, but the other note to that again is, you know, coarse salts are gonna melt over time. And we all have different kinds of salt at home. So I'm gonna kind of try to teach you guys tonight um, a couple ways of strategizing how much salt to use because um, if you've ever read the book or seen the TV show, um, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, Simon Nostra does a great job of talking about this, which is different salts have different salinities. And so the salt that, you know, Jen has and the salt that I have um, might have a different salinity, right? And this, so, and it's going to be different for everyone. So I have a couple tricks for how to sort of curtail that based on a recipe. Um, that way you guys feel comfortable and, you know, you can go rogue and make your miso and be happy. Um, and then the other thing is something to ferment in. Um, you know, Lisa was awesome and got you guys koji and jars together. Um, I like glass jars for this because odds are we're not going to be making five gallon buckets of miso. Um, you know, if we were living out in the woods and doing more traditional practices, we would have big, you know, wooden barrels, um, you know, to do our fermentation in and we would be doing giant batches. But most of us were fermenting at home and we're not going to be doing that. So, um, you know, my two notes are ceramic is great. Glass is great. You can even ferment in plastic buckets. Um, you're not going to want to ferment in metal because, um, metal is reactive and I'm pretty sure most of us don't have like, you know, stainless steel wine fermenting tanks at home or something to like do our fermentation in. Um, or, you know, giant wooden barrels that are, you know, set up and cultured and stuff. Um, once you have that, you're good to go. And that is the beautiful thing. Um, so let's talk about preparation. All right. Any questions about that so far? Before I, before I move on. Okay, groovy. So beans and cooking beans. Um, your, your main prep for making miso will always be to prepare your beans. Now, you're going to want to use dried beans, you know, not canned beans. Um, and you're, what you're going to do is, what, and what I always do is I take my beans, I get them, and I soak them overnight. Cover them really well with water, soak them, you know, for 8 to 12 hours. And what soaking does is it starts the fermentation process. And so this is where... Um, the fermentation really starts is just by soaking these beans, all right? Now beans, all kinds of legumes, grains and seeds have um, a little outer coating uh, called phthalates, and those phthalates um, are sort of these little protective shields, if you will, and they, you know, irritate the stomach lining. So when we soak, we're actually breaking up that, um, that outer coating um, and so soaking beans is really great. Um, and then what you're going to do is once you've soaked them, strain them out, put them in fresh water, cook them. Everybody cook their beans for class tonight. But the, you know, how long, it's going to vary for everybody, depending on what kind of bean you pick. You know, I picked these smaller kind of cream peas tonight. Um, these cooked relatively fast. You know, if you're cooking something like chickpeas, it might take longer. Um, but, you know, checking them for it to be al dente. Al dente, like, you know, when you have pasta and it's not super cooked all the way, but it's just like a little spring to it, that's what you're going for. Because when you overcook your beans, they get too wet. And then what happens is we end up with soggy, soggy miso, and it just doesn't really work out as well as we would like. So al dente is what you're going for. And what's what I always do is once my beans are cooked, I immediately strain them out right? Pour all my liquid in here. And I'm going to, and I saved my bean juice. How many, how many of you guys saved your bean juice? Hopefully people got that memo. Great. All right. If you didn't, no worries. Have a little bit of water handy, but your bean juice, this is awesome stuff. It kind of works like glue. Um, so I like to save my bean juice and use it. Another great chip, um, tip is that bean juice, you guys can freeze it. It's full of nutrients. You can freeze it and put it in soups and stocks and stuff later on. So fun tip, waste nothing. All right, and then we're kind of good to go. So I've got my beans. They have cooled down. I'm gonna just move them into this bowl. 
This is my bean juice. I've got I, does it matter? Wait, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like the different, so it's like a cup of the dried black beans, but if you were doing a different type of bean, maybe you would only use like two thirds of a cup or? Use the same, you can use the same amount. Now for some people, you know, if, or if you guys are gonna make extra misos, um, I like to do sometimes 50-50. If I'm not sure how long I wanna go with it, you can even go like a 50-50, 50% koji, 50% beans. Um, we're doing the, the longer red miso recipe tonight. So um, a good rule of thumb is if you don't have a recipe or you don't, you know, say you're somewhere else. I don't know, there's a zombie apocalypse, so you wanna make miso. You would do like two parts beans to one part koji rice. So it's a nice ratio if you wanna think about it like that. Um, to do it. But the beautiful thing about miso, you have wiggle room here, right? And if you're like, I want to do a short miso, you could always do more koji and less beans. We're going to do this longer one because who doesn't want to surprise a year from now or nine months from now? I do. I don't know about you. Okay, so you have your beans. Now, each bean has a hole, right? If you look at your bean in that little dip, dippy dip, there's like a little spot, that's the hole. Now my koji has aspergillus or rice, but if my holes and my beans aren't broken, the mold spores can't get into the beans. So you're gonna mash these. So this is where you just take out all your aggression, madness about the coronavirus, your cat puked on the floor, whatever it is. All right, so this is, this is the fun part, is the mashing part. You can do it with your hands. Um, that's how I usually do it. Sometimes I'll use the back of a jar um, to mash. I don't like doing the food processor. The only reason I don't is I find that some of my beans get super choppy and then the rest are like total mush. And so I like to kind of just break them up with my hands. Lisa's got an implement over there. So to each is their own. I'm just using a potato masher. Yeah, old fashioned, right? Yeah. A lot of the black beans really are like, it's like a real dye on them. Like, yeah. it really is. A... I like to make my fist to kind of squish them and rotate my bowl. A lot of my students in person, they like to take the back of their jar that they're going to put their miso in and use it as a masher. It's very cute. All right. So you're just breaking. Again, like, look, if you end up having a couple beans that aren't mashed, it's not the end of the world, but you really want to try to make sure that every hole is broken. So y'all are going to be hanging out with this for a minute or two or three or four um, mashing beans. But again, really key to break these all up. I had to cook my beans earlier because I was in class, and so mine are a little, little stiff. Oh, is that the trick? The closer you cook? Because I did mine too. I did mine like at like four o'clock. Yeah. Sometimes when they're a little bit warm, they're a little easier, but that's okay. They're breaking. Yeah. When I teach big workshops and I have to make beans for all my students so I can make beans, um, you know, they just come out of the fridge and the whole deal. All right. Slightly hard. Um, how hard are they, Jen? Can you squish them or are they too hard? I'll show you because I got the soybeans from the Japanese market nearby, but see how they're kind of mashing like that? Okay. Is that undercooked? I can't quite tell. Are they just too hard to break them up or are they? They're, they're breaking up, but they're not like mushy. Like they're not like they're like. No, you know, not good. So. As long as they're breaking, you should be okay. Yeah, it almost looks like broken peanuts. Yeah, great. Okay. Good. All right, cool. As long as the hull gets broken, that's the biggest thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like that little sheath over top. Okay. Yeah, that's like maybe cook them like two or three more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. If you have an Instant Pot at all, too, for anybody who has Instant Pot, sometimes I'll do beans in an Instant Pot and it's usually like five minutes to al dente, depending on the bean. The only glitch to that is you have to be able to get the lid off your Instant Pot Im immediately. And if you don't, um, your beans will go soggy. And that's happened to me 
a couple times. So that's my one word of caution. Okay. How are we doing on our mashing? Cathartic? Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> this is where the real party is, just so you know. Yeah, I got some mashers down there, groovy. I know my friend was like, are you going out for a drink tonight? And I was like, no, I'm teaching a miso class. And I was like, it's like the best party there could be. She was like, okay, weirdo. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna bring this around so you guys can see it. Just so you guys kind of get a sense, you know, of mine here. So you guys can kind of see how it's like relatively broken up. I also always think it smells a little bit like popcorn when, when you cook beans for some reason, like earthy popcorn. Okay. Don't forget if you have a, you know, a few miscellaneous beans, it's gonna be okay, but try to get, do as good as you can. Okay. So I've got my beans. Once you've mashed them up, what you guys are gonna do is you're gonna get your koji together. Now, I have a trick for this. I like to have a second bowl. What I like to do, and I'm just eyeballing mine because I've done this so many times that I become that lady. Okay. What I like to do is dump my koji in a bowl and that bean juice, that liquid. If you didn't see your bean juice, you can use a little bit of water for this. You're not gonna use a lot, but I like to put maybe a tablespoon to start of liquid on top of my koji and let it hang out. I do this because I actually believe that this helps activate the aspergillus a little bit and by just sort of wetting it. So I also find it makes it a little easier for mixing the dried koji in with the wet, um, the beans. So you don't need a ton, it's gonna suck it right up like a little sponge, all right? If you have a pool of liquid, you have a little too much liquid. So just a little bit here. You guys can kind of see mine. It's just a little bit wet. And I like to kind of massage it a little bit. All right, so this is my koji. And the reason I like to wet it also is it helps it to kind of bind up into little chunks, all right? And so that's why I like to wet my koji is because if I squeeze it, you know, it'll sort of start to stick together. So that is kind of another reason why I like to do it this way. All right. Koji has a distinct smell. It does, especially once you wet it. <laughs> All right. How are we doing so far? Everybody's good? Okay. So this is where things get crazy. All right. This is a choose your own adventure point of class. All right. Choose your own adventure because this is a good time to be like, wow, I think I might want to add some other flavors. This is when you would do it. What I mean by other flavors, you might have leeks that you want to thin slice and chop them up nice and small and throw in. You might have garlic cloves that you want to mince up and throw in. One of my favorite miso combos is garlic and red chili flakes. Like hands down. Um, dandelion, such a lovely green. Sometimes I like to thin slice and mix, mince it up and throw a little bit of dandelion in with my miso. All right. So there are some things, jalapeno is really great. Um, you know, I wouldn't say throw everything in your brother into your miso by any means, throw up the kitchen sink in there. But if you wanna pick a couple things that you think will be tasty and add a little flavor, give it a go. Um, I'm gonna just add a little red chili flakes to mine tonight. Just to give it a little, just a little spice. I wanna let everybody know, I have more um, koji rice at the library. So if you are interested and you wanna email me, if you're going basic today and then start mulling over what Cheryl said, 
let me know and I'll give you some more cojones because that was that really you had to order that really isn't so widely available yeah if you have a if there are sunrise marts in Jersey or if you're in the city um sunrise mart um sells koji also so if you're you know near a sunrise mart um sometimes some of the times the Japanese markets will have them okay so I added a little red chili flakes to mine. I'm gonna throw my koji in with my beans. Now, I like to keep my bean juice handy because I might decide I need a little bit more bean juice. This can vary based on the kinds of beans you have used. All right, so you know, even while I sent you guys like a basic recipe, that can shift a little bit. Again, your salt, the amount of liquid you use. My test for if I need a little bit of liquid is once I've mixed my koji in and my beans, if I can do a squeeze test and make it into like a ball. Mine's a little crumbly. I'm gonna add a little bit more bean juice to mine. Okay, and somebody was asking in the chat about removing the outer shells of the beans. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. And at this point, should we be having, should we have put the salt into the bean juice? We haven't yet. Okay, so I'm it's just being it juice right now. Way. I'm gonna do it in a slightly different way. Okay. Um, for a reason, so. Okay. All right, so I have a little bit more bean juice to mine. Again, if I can squeeze it together and it starts to hold together in like a chunk, that's kind of what I'm going for. Now, sometimes when people make koji, they do this different ways. Some people like to put it through a meat grinder um, which is something like when I'm making big batches of miso, I'll put my miso, uh, my beans and my koji through a meat grinder together um, to kind of blend it and make it into balls. Uh, but not, you know, we don't all have that, <laughs> right? And so we're doing it in what I call the chunky states. Um, we're gonna make a kind of chunky state and we'll talk about how to work from there. All right, the next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna add salt. Now we all have different salt salinities, right? So here's the rule of thumb. You want, and we probably don't all have food scales at home. You want 8% salt to, koji, uh, to miso ratio. What the hell does that mean? How many of you are going, what? What, Cheryl? 8%. So here's a rule of thumb. You're going to salt it. Salt it like you would treat a sharpie marker. All right? I'm going to do like three good pinches. But you're going to want to be able to taste the salt in it. This is a good way to learn. All right, that way you're not just like guessing based on your kind of salt. Add less, you can always add more. Once you have salt in there, you can't take it away, right? So I like to mix it up well, give it a taste. Can I taste the salt? Like, is it like a pungent salty potato chip? Not the ocean, not quite an anchovy, but salty. Mine, is, mine needs more salt, so I'm gonna add more. All right. I like, I prefer to do my misos like this than to even follow the recipe I sent you guys. So, you know, personal choice, but I think this is more accurate and it accommodates for those uh, salt changes and different kinds of beans a little bit better. All right, I'm mixing mine up again and tasting it again. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. That's pretty good. Okay. I'm pretty happy with that. Salty. Again, not so salty that you can't enjoy it, but salty enough where you're like, whoo, salty movie popcorn, right? It's like, it's almost too salty and you just feel like you need to drink like a gallon of water at the end. All right, that's the kind of salty we're going for. And does this make sense for everybody? All right, cool. Okay. This is where I like to do a little squeeze test. If I can ball it up in my hand and it's kind of sticking together, okay? I know I'm ready to go to the next step. All right. Am I the only one over here eating miso? Lisa's eating miso. Okay. So here's the trick. This is how I like to do it. Take your jar. Remember how I said bean juice? It kind of works like glue. What I like to do is put it in my, my jar, my vessel, and I like to rotate it all the way around so the bean juice gets all the way up to around the rim. And I pour the extra back in my 
little jar. Then I sp start sprinkling my salt. You're gonna coat the entire jar. Like you want it to have that caked to death, but you want salt everywhere. Salt does two things in fermentation. It crowds out the bad stuff. It allows us to grow the good stuff. So I like to kind of just sprinkle it around. You could use a spoon. I like to use my hands. Get the bottom, get the sides. I'll kind of show you guys this up close. So see how I'm getting it all around these edges. All right. And all this is, is like, this is like your insurance policy. <laughs> it's a thing then to protect you, right? So that's what I like to do. Once you've done that, I like to kind of squeeze my, my miso into like little balls. So I'm not hitting the sides. This is part of the reason I do that. If we went and saw traditional miso making happen, they would have big barrels, be making this into balls, throwing the balls down into the barrels, um, lining them up, packing them down. Um, we're not in that situation. I've watched grown male men in miso workshops um, in person try to throw little tiny basketballs at each other in miso class. Um, you don't have to do that. But again, trying not to scrape all the salt off the sides, just kind of carefully dropping it, kind of dropping it in. And then as you need to, you can kind of push, start pushing it down with your fingers a bit. All right, you're gonna fit quite a lot in here. And now I'm at the point where I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna start pushing down. I like to use the front of my knuckles and kind of bend them down and just kind of tuck it. Because here's the thing, you don't want air pockets in this. If I have a bunch of air pockets in here, what's gonna, what it's saying is, hey, bad stuff, come here and grow. <laughs> All right, you don't want that. So, and also as you start to push, you're gonna realize you can put a little bit more in here. I like to leave a little bit of room in the top of my jar, usually half an inch or so, so you could fill to the bend in your jar or just past. Leave a little bit of space. But you want less is more. Like I think I, I didn't make enough miso. I made like only two thirds of a cup. I should add more in. I should just make more, right? You want it more full. Wow, was that all your beans? No, I have many more. All right, dump it back in a bowl, put it all back together and just mash it all together. The and mashing. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, let's fill you up, right? Make your efforts worth it. How's everybody else doing? Good so far? Okay. Letting everybody mash away. So you guys can kind of see, I'm kind of rotating my jar and I'm just putting some pressure, packing it down. I like to look at the sides and you're not going to get rid of every air pocket in the world. But again, look around. If you see a big air pocket in there, get things, press it down until you kind of get rid of it because big air pockets equal bad things. Okay. I'm going to grab my wax paper while you guys are filling your jars. little rag or piece of paper towel and I like to wipe my rim because this stuff is going to gunk up and it's going to be hard to get your lid off down the road. So I like to kind of wipe my rim, clean it up. Okay and then you guys can see mine so far. So pretty packed in there. It's not watery, it's not runny. Okay. 
Once you've done this, once you've wiped your rim, sprinkle the top with salt. Again, okay, a little bit of insurance policy. Kind of get it all around the edges. I like to kind of tap it around a little bit too, just so I kind of hit all the ends. All right, so there's my salted top. Okay. Give everybody a minute to make sure they're good to go here. So I don't want to go ahead without everybody. So give everybody a minute to keep packing. Give me a thumbs up maybe when you're ready. You're good. <laughs> yeah, great. Once you've sprinkled the top surface and you've wiped your rim and you've uh, done salt on top, I like to take a piece of either wax paper or parchment if you have it. Um, and I actually like to just kind of you know, I kind of tear it to size or cut it to size, but what I like to do is have a little piece and I like to tuck it in the very top of my jar on top of the salt. If you don't have this, don't worry. I like to do this and here's why. Again, insurance policy. If something funky grows later on, it's more likely going to grow on my parchment paper or my little piece of wax paper than on my actual miso. And so, again, a little bit of insurance policy here. I'll show you guys how I did it. So I salted and then I just tucked a little piece of parchment. I kind of ripped it so that the, excuse me. All right, and again, if you don't have this, no stress, but it's something I like to do. Another way you could do it is, um, Sometimes I'll use, like, if I have um, kelp or some kind of um, bigger dried seaweed, I'll soak it in a little bit of water, squeeze it out really well, and then tuck a little bit of seaweed on top of here. Um, and that's another great ingredient. I didn't bring it up before, but, um, you know, if you guys are looking for other things to add to your miso, um, seaweed. Not nori, but, like, if you have bladder whack or kelp or dulse or, um, you know, some kind of other seaweed, um, you know, you can cut it up really small and mix it in, um, and it's a great addition to miso um as well so uh seaweed is awesome all right once you're here you're throwing your lid on and then what i like to do is take a piece of tape um something that's going to stick to my jar and i like to write the date and what is in it what kind of beans are you using what kind of koji are you using did you add other ingredients? All right, put all that on your label because this is gonna sit and ferment and I promise you two weeks from now, a month from now, six months from now, however long you ferment, what is gonna happen is you're not gonna remember what is in here. So I'm gonna call it St. Patty's Miso and it's cream peas. with red chili. Okay. So I'm making my label. I'd like to throw it on the side of my jar. This is sort of my, my end effect here. So I don't have any big air pockets. I've packed it down nice and tight. I've salted the top. I've put my parchment on top. I've made my St. Patty's Miso label. Actually, this class now reminds me I need to open up all my uh, quarantine misos from a year ago, uh, from last year's misos classes. <laughs> I have not touched them in a year, so I'm gonna, time to open those up and see. All right, 
So now what do you do? Do you put them like in your a dark pantry for the time and then when you open it, that's when it goes in the fridge? Um, there's some options. Let's give every, let me just give everybody a second, make sure we got everybody here, just to make sure we don't lose anybody. All right. If people are good, if people good to, uh, looks like we have some labeling, some cleaning up. All right, cool. So let's go to the next part. You've labeled this. You've loved it. You've named it. You're going to, you know, sing it a song, send it some good juju, whatever you, you know, feel entitled to do. And what's going to happen is this is going to go ideally in a cool and dark place. Now, I have fermented in a New York City apartment for 16 years next to a window with no air conditioning um, in all conditions, and it's been okay. But most ferments like, like between 64 and 74 degrees. Um, you know, a cabinet, a closet, someplace out of the way um, is most ideal because your guys aren't going to touch these for a while. And when I say you're not going to touch for a while, I would let these, this ferment for a minimum of 16 weeks. So, I mean, and ideally, I would let this go a year. Now, one thing we haven't talked about is miso runs on what's called miso time. So let's talk about what miso time is, because I see the, sh the faces of shock. <laughs> so miso time is that summer months are double time. So it's the winter, right? It's March. So we have March, April, May, but when we get to June, depending on where you live, it's going to be count as two months. July is going to count as two months. August is going to count as two months. So by August, you're going to have a nine month miso. All right. If you want to wait till, you know, September, October, November of 2021, by November 21, 21, you would have a one year miso. So I recommend doing between six months and 12 months and keep in mind miso time. Now, when you stop this is up to you. You guys are the adventurers, the deciders, the entire thing. So really, it's like how I like to do it is I like to tuck it away, forget about it. Put a reminder in your calendar. Um, I had students come back and be like, oh, I forgot about my miso. I found it back in the back of a closet from two years ago. We were moving and I went to go do a final sweep of my apartment and found our misos and we sat on the floor of our naked apartment and tried our misos for the first time. Um, you know, I mean, if you want to go that route, you can. You know, I have misos that are five years old, six years old, that are still fermenting um, under my bed because <laughs> that's where I keep them. Um, you know what I mean? So it's like, I have a goal to do a 10 year miso and I'm getting closer to achieving that, you know? So it's like, these can go longer if you choose. Um, but I think for most of you guys, you're going to be really eager and excited to try these. So I would recommend six to 12 months. And how do you know it's ready? Like, get it, open it, give it a smell. How does it smell? You know, like take the paper back and if you just barely dig under the surface layer because the top layer is going to be very salty, dig under a little bit, get a little taste. All right. And we're going to talk about safety um, because this is part of it. Now, how safety works is this. Open it up. Look at it. Does it look like something you want to put in your mouth? All right. You're always going to end up taking out this top parchment layer. And then even if something is growing, that doesn't mean it's bad. Mold does not equal bad in fermentation. All right. This is an important rule. Black, white, gray, green, things that grow on bread or cheese, put on your depression era grandma helmet, scrape it off. Okay. All right. But red, black, neon colors equals dead, don't eat it. I've never seen black, red, or neon colors on miso. Um, I've seen it on a kombucha scoby once after I sawed out a case. All right but it's still good tools to have in your toolbox, all right? So again, anything that's gonna grow on bread or cheese, scrape it off, ask yourself, what would my grandma tell me to do? And you'll probably be a-okay, all right? So look at it then. Does it look like something you wanna put in your mouth? I like to take a spoon and scrape off a little bit of that top layer because it's gonna be super salty, all right? So, number two, smell it. Does it smell like something you wanna put in your mouth? Nothing should ever smell like a dead body, a moldy basement, your brother's dirty gym socks, all right? Things should smell tangy, sour, yeasty. If you smell something and your mouth juice ups, that's your salivary emulates. 
coming out. And really that's your body's natural instinct saying, hey, I'm okay, eat me. All right, so we're going for good smells, things that are tangy, sour, maybe a little sweet, sort of yeasty, maybe a little bread-like, all right? Um, maybe even a little bit earthy, but nothing, no, no mold, no dirty gym socks, no dead bodies, all right? Um, if, that, if you hit that, you know something's gone wrong. Fermentation will tell you if it's right or wrong, almost always, all right? And so in the majority of cases. And so um, that's just something to keep in mind. Once you've looked at it, done the look test, you've done the smell test, taste it. Do, you know, does it taste good? Is it tangy? Is it sour? Are you like, wow, I like this, but I think I want it to go a little bit longer. Great, make sure it's packed down, put a little bit more salt, tuck the paper back in, tuck it away for a little bit longer. You can do that. You know, the one thing I don't do is I don't like do dig big wells in the ecosystem. I like to sort of like let it do its job. I like to kind of stick with like the top surface, you know, but if you want to tuck it away and let it ferment longer again, you could. Uh, but maybe you're like, wow, this tastes amazing. I'm really excited. Great. You took your paper off, you scrape off that top salty layer, throw it in the fridge, and then it's good to go. You know, miso can last in your refrigerator for years. Again, I have, you know, this, this dandelion miso has been in my fridge for three years, easily, maybe longer. Um, but you know, it's like that miso can last a, a really long time. Mold, um, in this case, aspergillus, is a pretty slow, um, slow roll. That looks pretty good. Is that paper tucked down in there? Okay, it's touching the miso tucked down. Good, good job. Um, and so that's what you guys really, um, you know, want to just sort of keep in mind. Okay, how do we feel about this? Can you do this at home again without me? That's the question. Probably. Okay, good. All right. Don't forget to wipe your rims. Really important. The other thing I like to do, and this is just to know, if you feel like your jar is edging on a little bit full, what you can do is, as the fermentation process happens, um, and as the mold starts to sort of break down the koji and the rice, um, it starts to get kind of liquidy. Um, do you guys know what tamari is? Um, tamari is kind of like soy-free soy sauce, or um, gluten-free soy sauce. Tamari is the liquid that will start to grow on this. Now, traditional miso, it goes through layers and it goes up with all these weights and it gets pressed and it's this beautiful thing and they squeeze all the tamari out. Um, but we're all at home. For most of us, that's, that's not a process that's going to happen. But what I like to do is sometimes if my jar is a little full, I like to take a little piece of tin foil and I'll make like a little tray with a little rim underneath this. So just in case it's tucked away in a closet and let's say six months from now you go to get it and some tamari leaked out, it isn't stuck. Um, one, one year my, I had a, a double milk crate of miso, one of the misos leaked and I couldn't get it and it was stuck on the floor under the bed, um, in, under my bed in Brooklyn. <laughs> and, it, and it took me, you know, a couple hours to unhinge it and get all the sticky meat, the sticky tamari cleaned up. Um, for most of you, that's probably not gonna happen, but if you want to do that or you're worried, I just tuck, you know, make a little tray out of aluminum foil, and then I have a little catcher just in case. Um, so, you know, I, I don't particularly wanna spend two hours scraping tamari off of, you know, a floor trying to unhinge jars again. So, a little lesson learned, okay? Uh, well, there was a question in the chat. Is it gonna look like paste in six months? And what do we do if it's ready? But I think you might be coming into that. There's so many things to do. <laughs> right. So it's going to hang out. Now, it's not going to look like paste when it comes out because we didn't turn it into paste to begin with. Now, this is where I think miso goes two ways. All right. And let me explain. Some um, traditional miso, they paste everything together, the beans and the koji ahead of time. That's why I like the meat grinder. Um, I have a KitchenAid mixer, I put it all in the meat grinder, it grinds it up, it's already sort of balled and pasted. That's one way of doing it. We're doing the chunky method. So what's gonna happen is fast forward. You've passed your safety test, right? You're like, wow, I can't wait to taste this. You can eat it chunky, totally acceptable to do. But what you can also do is, what I like to do is put all my miso into a nut milk bag or like an old t-shirt. And if I put it over a bowl and I kind of squeeze it, I'm gonna get out any excess tamari. 
So then I can move that and have that liquid, you know, use it, make a stir fry, um, you know, marinate some fish in it, something like that, pork tenderloin, gorgeous. But I like to move all my miso into that milk milk bag, put some pressure on it, let that tamari drip out. Then take your miso, throw it into a blender or a food processor and process it and you can turn it into a paste then. So, and then you'll have the tamari and then you'll have more of the pasted miso and you can just put it back in a jar and put it in the fridge. So you have three options. Leave it chunky, just put it in the fridge, enjoy it as it is. You can put it in the nut milk bag, squeeze out that tamari, separate, so you're separating it out, blend it into a paste, put it back in the jar. Um, you can also blend it with the tamari. Sometimes you don't get a lot of tamari and it's sometimes what I do is I'll just blend it all together. I'll leave the tamari in it and it's still tasty as can be um, and it makes it a little sweeter. And so you can do that too because again, if we were doing bigger batches of this, if we were doing a five gallon bucket of this, our output would be a little different. All right, so because we're doing a small batch like we are at home, um, you know, I think this makes it a little bit easier for everybody, hopefully. Um, and again, that tamari, you can bottle it up, put it in the fridge, use it as, as you want and choose, um, and you know, enjoy. And then you kind of get a two for one. All right, how do we feel about this? We're good? All right. I just wanna... Oh, what? Good. Oh, good, woo, okay, great. Hard card. Well, okay. So let's move on to some other things. All right. I want to talk about some other options. These are the basic, basic principles to miso making. All right. Everything you just did, it's basically the same. The difference is if I want to make a shorter, lighter miso, I'm going to use more what? Koji. And if I want to make a longer, darker miso, I'm going to use more beans. All right. You guys got it. Brilliant. Okay. Let's talk about what to do. You've made all this miso. You've gotten the miso bug. You go get all Lisa's koji from the library. You make more. What do we do with all this miso? Um, there's a lot of things you could do. Obviously, miso soup is um, pretty traditional. Now, to make miso soup, you don't boil your miso. You put your miso in a cup with a little bit of kind of warm water to temper it. You never make miso with boiling water. Nothing upsets me more <laughs> than going to a Japanese restaurant who brings me boiling hot miso soup. They've killed all the microbes because heat kills everything. That doesn't mean that we're not still getting amazing benefits, but boiled miso soup is just like a no-no, okay? So like, again, I like to temper it with some warm water, and then I like to cover it with hot water. I'm not boiling it, like putting it in a bowl, I mean, in a pan and boiling it to death, all right? That's how you would do more of like a traditional miso soup, add your other things. Um, same thing if you wanted to make like a broth and do more of like a ramen style bowl. Miso, great addition. Um, one of our favorite things is actually what we call the miso mug. Um, we do it for breakfast a lot. We do both, we make our own bone broth and we'll put a spoonful of miso paste in our bone broth and drink that for breakfast or as a snack. Um, you know, other things you guys can do, um, miso ice cream. If you're into making ice cream at all, adding miso into it. Miso cheesecake, also really great. Um, miso caramel popcorn, one of my favorite things. Um, I love popcorn. If you pop popcorn and then you make like a basic caramel, um, you know, I, I make my caramel with butter and sugar. And when it starts to melt down and you're starting to get that caramelized color, add a spoonful of miso paste into it and you know, turn the heat off, stir it up, drizzle it all over the popcorn. It is so hella good. Um, you know, so things I miss about in-person workshops. I used to make miso caramel popcorn and bring it for all my students. Um, you know, other things, guys, um, miso and peanut butter, really good. Um, miso peanut butter sandwich. I know, sounds gross, not gross at all. But also like marinades, if you wanna make salad dressings. Adding in miso. Um, I learned a trick years ago from somebody where um, it was putting a couple bunches of fresh cilantro in a food processor or the blender with garlic cloves, miso paste, and some um, umami um, plum vinegar, umami plum vinegar, a little salt, blending it up and making a kind of like a cilantro miso dip. So good. You know, so it's like, it gets you thinking about like, well, what are other ways I can use this? 
if you want to, you know, put miso paste on fish and, you know, and then bake it um, is really excellent. Um, sometimes I use it as a marinade. You know, I'll take, you know, soy sauce and fish sauce and a little bit of miso paste and maybe some red chili, you know, red chili paste, make a marinade, marinade, um, you know, marinate pork or steak or some kind of other meat in it and let it really sit and let those microbes sort of help to break down those proteins. And then I'll use that, cook it, slice it up and it's, you know, excellent. So it gets you thinking a bit about um, how to use miso. And also koji is a great ingredient. Um, you know, you can um, take dried koji. If I take dried, ko dried koji and I even grind it up in um, a coffee grinder and I take a piece of meat, let's say I have a steak and I pack that piece of steak, press the koji, dried koji into a piece of meat and cover it, put it in the fridge, let it sit for two to four hours it will actually cure, cure and start to break down that meat. Those mold spores will start to actually activate the enzymes and start to break it down. And then what I do is kind of rinse off the piece of meat when I, when it, when I pulled it out of the fridge and then add a little salt, pepper, sear it up and it'll be the best steak you've ever had. Um, you know, and so koji in itself is really great. Um, you can also wet it. Um, I'll work it into pasta. If I'm making pasta, um, I'll add fresh or, um, dried koji that I've moistened and mix it into pasta dough um, and stuff like that. You can mix koji and make a cookie dough, all kinds of stuff. So it's a fun ingredient when you get really into it. Um, you know, again, there's a million things you can do with both miso and with koji. So I don't want anybody to feel like, oh, I have this bag of koji and I don't know what to do with it. There's a lot you can do with it. All right. So something to sort of keep in mind. Um, what else can I tell you guys? Oh, I wanted to show you the differences between an old miso and a newer miso. Woo! I'm going to smell them. They're so different. So this is actually a light colored miso. So this is more like a nine month miso. And you, when I smell it, it's definitely sweet. All right. This one had a lot more koji in it. When I go into this dark miso, you can barely see in the chart, it's just like a tunnel of darkness. And even when I smell this dark miso, this smells earthy. This smells a little bit more like sharp, a little bit more sour versus this one's a little bit more sweet. All right, this one, definitely you're like, ooh, that's been there for a little bit. Like it has that deep smell. Those lighter misos, it's gonna be, you know, definitely smells lighter in flavor. It definitely smells sweeter, all right? So it's fun. You know, even if you guys are like, I don't want to wait for my miso, like if you're out at the market, grab a light miso, grab a dark miso. It's, it'll be fun to sort of play with and think about um, ingredients and like what you have and how, how things are. All right, do you feel safe? Let's well, okay. All right, great. Nobody feels like they're gonna kill themselves or their loved ones, awesome. Um, you know, also, you know, there's this great book, here, I'll show it to you. It's called Miso Tempe Nato. Um, this is my friends, Kirsten and Christopher's third book. Um, their fourth and fifth book just came out this year. So this is their third book, but um, I was one of their meat to makers and contributors. So I've got a couple of recipes in here, including for um, what is called Tasty Paste, which is nut and seed misos. You can actually make misos using nuts and seeds. They're a much shorter, quicker ferment. Um, but this is a great grab if you guys are wanting to get into other forms of, um, you know, fermenting and bean-based ferments. Um, this is really fun. And, you know, making your own koji and stuff like that is in here as well. Um, so it's a fun read. Um, I, I have a ton of other workshops coming up. You guys can always visit us at contrabandferments.com. Um, you know, I have all kinds of online workshops right now. Um, I also teach on plastic-free living and gut health and all kinds of other things um, on the, in the functional wellness kind of world, um, along with fermentation. And as the seasons change, so do our workshops. We're on Instagram and all the things. So please tag us in your posts. Uh, workshops have really um, been the thing that have kept us in business this year. So thank you for being here. And I'm gonna stay on and answer other questions that you guys have. Um, so we'll like open it up to, 
I don't know. What are you guys thinking about? What you making? Other ferments too. Doesn't just have to be. Right. Well, well, thanks, Cheryl. And I had mentioned before too when people were signing up. I think I, I for, as for the library, we will do a follow up with recipes too. Of like, okay, we've got our somebody's son is already dying for some soup, but it's amazing with how much you can use miso. So we will be doing a follow up of once we. We're fermented, but now I guess it's going to be a one year. I was thinking six months, but maybe St. Patrick's Day next month. year. We're going to ferment away. <laughs> I mean, like seriously, like I would put some reminders in my calendar. Open it up at three months. See what's going on. Open it at six months. Like you know, like sometimes I have students that they come to class and like I can't, I cannot wait. Like past three months, I just can't. And they're like, at three, you know, it's not like it's going to be bad or something's going to be wrong with it. Um, the flavor is going to change. So that's why it's, it's nice to taste it at different points. Um, and sometimes what I like to do is, you know, those of you who might go get extra koji from Lisa, like make a bunch of batches. You know, sometimes it's fun to make a batch. It's like three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. You labeled all of them all with like your goals. Um, you know, I have one jar upstairs um, under my bed that is labeled the 10 year miso. And it's got like a little crown and it's got little aliens crawling out of it. And I'm like, it's like the gold miso. And I'm like, and it says, do not eat me <laughs> on the jar, you know? So it's like, it's fun to sort of see, um, you know, what happens. I mean, but again, just remember time refines flavor. So what it tastes like at three months is not what it's gonna taste like at six months, um, you know? And so that's, and that's where it's, it's fun. You guys are the deciders, not me. So it's something good to keep in mind. <laughs> Teresa's son wants soup. It's like, hit me. That's good. He knows what's up. <laughs> what other questions do you guys have? So if we put the jar away when it's kind of warm, is that, that's okay, right? If it's so, yeah. it is. Okay. Yeah, it'll be okay. All right, good. Yeah, that's cool. And so then, so you, do you make your own, um, like, what is that? Uh, what's the fermented tea? Oh my gosh, why am I blanking on it? Oh yeah, kombucha. Yeah, I make my own kombucha. I, make, I mean, literally, if you were like, Cheryl, here's five ingredients, what are you gonna ferment? It'd be like my favorite game in the world. Yeah. I, 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 you know, and I'm really, I also really believe like, you know, fermentation, and different ferments have different makeups and different things that are important about them. Um, but I, I also, you know, I think that fermentation is such a great resource for food waste. You know, like stuff that people throw away sometimes that they're gonna go throw away. I'm like, why are you throwing that away? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, we can make fermented pesto with that. We could do with this, we could do with that, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty um, versatile. Um, and I was telling my, you know, my, a lot of my students, I'm like, you can ferment anything. The only thing I tell them not to ferment are white potatoes because white, white potatoes raw are poisonous, but technically you can ferment them. I just don't want them toying with things that they're not ready for. Um, and usually I'm like, mushrooms can be a little weird. Um, but you know, other than that, I'm like, everything else, fair game. Like, you know, um, but different, you know, different, again, different things, different processes. How we would make fermented vegetables is very different than how we would make miso. Very different than how we would make kombucha, right? Um, and so it's, and it's definitely fermentation, it's a definitely a process, like once you get the bug, it's like, you know, you got the bug, you got bit, you got bit hard. <laughs> I love seeing, I have like, I had a student in a class workshop the other night and she was like telling everybody, oh yeah, so I always ask people like, put stuff in the chat, what are you even making? And she was like, this is my 21st workshop with you. <laughs> I was like, 21? She's like, I've taken 21 classes with you just during the pandemic. <laughs> like wow I, you know, and I guess you know also to add to that like we are made of bacteria and viruses guys like in and on us we carry three trillion bacteria in and on us and viruses in and on us like um, we can't get away from them so you know these microbial foods just from a health kind of component um, you know they are super high in nutritive value you know it's like I know if I take a cabbage and I ferment it and I make something like sauerkraut, I'm tripling the vitamin C, I'm tripling the vitamin K, I'm super increasing that nutritive value to the point where like sailors used to keep um, that to sauerkraut on ships because they knew it would treat scurvy and scurvy was a vitamin C deficiency, um, you know? And so people have been using um, 
you know, microbial foods for all kinds of reasons and purposes. Um, and, um, you know, and so should, you know, so should we. Now, occasionally there are people who don't, can't handle microbial foods very well. You know, it does happen. So, um, you know, um, and we're all unique, how much we can handle in our bodies. Sometimes people have like histamine reactions and they, they can't handle fermented foods for a little bit. Um, you know, so I, you know, I also want to be fair and like, you know, while they're great for a good majority of people, there are sometimes people that fermented foods don't really work for in the now. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't at some point. So um, just a note there. Other questions you guys have? So many nice little, yeah, cool, thank you. Oh God, it, you know, learning is fun, if you ask me. That's what I do. I think you kind of enlightened a few of us. I think we were, I mean, I was definitely curious. <laughs> we had a few, a few people here too. So a little curious, maybe a little like, okay, we're, we'll see where this goes in three months. You know, we're, we're starting on our adventure. If you guys are ever like, hey, I'm not sure what's happening with my knee, so I feel stuck. I just need a little support. You can always, um, Lisa, you can put this in the chat. You can always email me at info at contrabandferments.com. Send photos. Ones that are not blurry is very helpful. Um, you can also DM them to us on Instagram if you need to. Um, yeah, we were, all, we're always happy to send feedback, give us some 48 to 72 hours to respond. Um, you know, or if you're like, I'm not sure, you know, like we will always, you know, check in with people and answer questions about ferments um, to the best of our ability. So um, you guys, you know, are always welcome to email us there and tag us in your, tag us in your photos, tag us in your, Absolutely. And, and I will post this and I, I will give a follow up email to, to the group that is here with some of the things that we were talking about today, along with we will post it on YouTube and we will be tagging you in it. Um, just very informative. Thank you so much. Um, I hope everybody else I am. I'm, I'm curious to see what everybody made. I am curious to see what their pictures are too, because I, I, I'm going to have to keep working on my batch. I wound up stopped paying attention, but I will continue. <laughs> Was I everybody throw in the chat what kind of miso you made? Like, what did you put in yours? What kind of beans did you use? That way everybody has some good ideas. Like I just did the salt, the regular one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna experiment though. I like that because there's a Japanese mart right in Ramsey, right near us. So that's where I got. Yeah, they might sell crunchy. If they're not selling it, you might be able to like be like, hey, can you get this in stock? Right. Uh, as well. You know, that where you got the soybeans? Did you get soybeans in that little mark in <laughs> Ramsey? Yeah, yeah, I got that, and then the other kind too that you recommended. I forget they're they're red. I think. Azuki beans. Yeah, the azuki beans. Yeah. Another trick for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have to head out. Thank you, though. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Another bean trick is um, sometimes what I'll do is soak my beans, cook my beans. If I have extra beans, I'll just freeze them. And then I have them for later because they've already been soaked and cooked. Okay. Um, and I don't, usually once I freeze them, I don't use them for miso, but I'll just use them for like soups or and other stuff. So if you ever like do too many, like, I, yeah, I did that tonight. Yeah, so I'm like, hmm, like I'll make a soup or something. <laughs> um, Azuki beans make amazing um, vegan burgers. If you mix them with like onion and spices and, um, you know, a little bit of like breadcrumbs or um, I like to use pork rinds of mine, like mash up pork rinds in it. But um, you can make burgers and then if you put them in um, a glass container with wax paper in between the layers, you can just freeze them and then you have them, they're like ready to go. Um, yeah, that's something I do a lot. Yeah, I'll try that. Pictures. So. Awesome. Well, thank you. It was yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And like I said, I will do a follow up email. Sure. So, okay. thanks to everyone. It was great to finally meet you, Cheryl. I'm going to.